Welcome to Marketplace Live. Let's defy gravity. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Marketplace Live 2020. I'm so glad to be here with you today, and I'm so sorry that we can't actually be in touch in person, but, you know, life is what it is in 2020. So a new normal, isn't it? Thank you very much for joining me. My name is May Ann. I'm the Executive Director of the Asia Cloud Computing Association, and I will be speaking to you today about the gravity of resilience. Now, the Asia Cloud Computing Association, we're always talking about this notion of resilience because, after all, we're talking about cloud computing and talking about data centers. Question for all of you this year, I suppose, is what exactly is weighing you and your business down? Do you have that resilience? at this point in time to, to interface with some of the problems which we're facing right now. We have an unpredictable economy that we're facing and with the world in a state of flux, there has been a very interesting uncertain development of one's certain trends and that has disrupted a lot of people's businesses and a lot of people's thinking. We've got, for example, we've got big data and data lakes. We used to talk about these and we continue to talk to, about these things. Of course, there is this use of big data and we've got to develop all these big data lakes and sort, sort of to make sure that we can make use of the last point, machine learning and artificial intelligence to make sense of the world so that we can help do prediction of trends, etc. And right now, and yet right now, we have a, a world which is a little bit worried about surveillance, a little bit worried about privacy issues. How is that going to proceed? We're not quite sure. What about Industry 4.0 and the Industrial Revolution 4.0, this, this notion of where is the next lap of development going to take us? Lots of discussion, usually during the World Economic Forum discussions at Davos um, in January, but we're not quite sure what, what, what's happening with that, given the current situation with the pandemic on. There are also questions around the Internet of Things. Is it still going to be developing as fast as it, it was? Uh, the development and the deployment of 4G and 5G networks, not quite sure yet. Well, the one thing that is certain is uh, in this uncertain world is that everything is going to be changing. So what's happening and where are we seeing some of the opportunities today? Well, I guess if you're not in the lead right now, we think that it might be your chance to pull ahead. And if you're not in the lead, you better start looking behind you if you're not quite sure and not quite certain of your lead. Or if you're actually, if you're very certain of your lead, you might want to start behind you. The one thing that underpins everything is right now we're seeing that strong data and infrastructure fundamentals do not change. They haven't changed in the midst of this shifting sands, in the midst of this unpredictable economy and uh, this world in a state of flux. For data centers, we're actually seeing that they're the BTS heroes. And for those of you who are looking at, at, at uh, BTS and wondering what is she doing talking about a Korean boy band, they're not the Korean boy band we're talking about. They're actually the behind the scenes heroes. There is this sudden burst of trendiness in once really unsexy topics. Okay, honestly, between you and me, I think that you, given the fact that you're here, you probably actually think these topics are pretty sexy. I think that they're pretty sexy as well, but let's face it, the rest of the world probably doesn't understand infrastructure and they don't think that it's sexy. But thanks to work from home and basically everything from home, and you can see the little diagram that I have on, on the right side, shopping, school, uh, work, meetings, everything is basically, it's X from home, you know, in the home to X A S, I suppose. Things like that used to be really unsexy, things like latency and bandwidth and IP traffic management, all of this all suddenly comes to the fore because everybody's doing everything online. I won't say everybody, I think I would say a large majority of people who didn't used to do these things online suddenly had to come online really, really quickly. And suddenly we had to think about things like resilience, like is the network resilient enough to take the load that is currently being shopped upon it? And also this idea of essential services. What exactly are essential services to us when everybody's in a state of lockdown, every Everybody's in a state of movement control orders. Now, one thing which I love about uh, the, the internet, it gives you fantastic research. Uh, Digital Realty, for example, has released a report called the Data Gravity Index, which takes data mass and multiplied by data activity, multiplied by bandwidth, divided by latency squared. And I don't know how many of you actually follow that. If you can't really follow that, don't worry about it. I have the link to the report right on top of that slide. 
uh, that you're seeing right now. And you can see that, that that formula actually gives you this idea of data gravity. Now, on the Asia Cloud Computing Association's side point of view, we, we, like to, we, we like to ask questions. And we love the questions that this formula actually poses to us because it does give you an idea of how exactly important resilience is to the market right now. For example, we're asking, we're asking questions like, for data mass, how much data could you be using? We, we look at this, okay, let's see how we can measure that, right? Well, international connectivity, for example, would be a great measurement of uh, data uh, mass at this point in time. The utilization of data centers in your country, how many people are you know, on data centers which, which they need to be using, how much of that, that utilization is being taken up? And then for data activity, we ask the question, how much data could you be processing and moving around? I mean, this is the potential, right? How much data could you be processing and moving around? So this really depends on the sophistication and the digitization of businesses. I think this is where a lot of governments, a lot of businesses themselves are really looking and, and trying to move ahead in that because we're realizing right now in an ex X from home world and everything from home world, you kind of need to make sure that your business is properly digitized and that that digitization is scalable and is long term. So that notion of you know how much data could you be processing and moving around very much dependent on that sophistication and digitalization of your business. Of course, there's also the second component of it, which is the regulatory support and friction to data utilization. Is the government, are regulations wittingly or unwittingly supporting or adding friction to some of the data use and data entrepreneurship that is happening? So this is something which we're seeing is a pretty important part of that data activity uh, component, which forms up the data gravity index. And the bandwidth question of it, this is very, Fairly simple, everybody just wants more bandwidth, right? Domestic broadband quality, 4G and 5G networks. How much data can be coming through the pipes is a big question. And latency in the similar vein is basically how fast that data is coming through. We talk about speed and we talk about uh, reliability. Not just for the data gravity index, but we don't just rely on one index, obviously. We, we, we come up with our own as well. For the ACCA, we, on a bi-annual basis every two years, we come up with the Cloud Readiness Index. And this year, we released the Cloud Readiness Index 2020. And we also have a, our partner organization, TRPC. We, all, we, we were also looking at how they put together the Data Center Security Index for 2020. And I'm going to go through both of these. The good news for all of you is that if you're actually looking for these resources, don't worry. You don't have to pay for them. They are completely free. I know, unbelievable. Completely free to be downloading. And uh, I put the links underneath the images for you, and you can download them. Um, if you want, there's no paywall and there's no exchange of information, just download them and read them. Let me know what you think, okay, about uh, the things that we're looking at. For the Cloud Readiness Index, we look, for the ACC, we look at it in terms of 10 parameters, okay? First, we have the hard infrastructure, international connectivity, how good is it? Uh, broadband quality, how strong is it? How reliable is it? Power grid, green policy and sustainability, data center risk, cybersecurity, privacy, government regulatory environment, um, uh, five, six and seven, uh, and eight, and including IP protection, they're a little bit more softer regulatory uh, regulatory components of the index. And then we have business sophistication and freedom of information rounding up the parameters. This next slide shows you the results of the Cloud Readiness Index, and you'll see the that I've highlighted a couple of red um, red components. Those are the lowest scoring or the lower scoring uh, parameters for the top uh, scoring countries. It's a little bit confusing. Uh, yeah, but they're the lowest scores for these top rated economies. And you'll see that we actually do have an issue with uh, in Asia Pacific for the sustainability of energy function. But you look down, if you look down the list of international connectivity um, and, and broadband uh, quality as well, you'll see that we're not doing fantastically well either. And this is throughout the whole entire uh, through, throughout the whole entire column of economies. And I really encourage you to have a quick look at that. The question that we ask, um, or the, the, the thing that we want to pose when we put together this index is we as the ACCA, we put to these economies saying, we think that you should be growing as a data economy. And here's our diagnosis of what's slowing you down. 
And the question is, when, when you look at all of this, the question for you that I would like to pose to you is, has your infrastructure, has the country's infrastructure been built for resilience? Mm, up and down, I think. You can see not quite the international connectivity uh, and broadband quality not quite there yet when it comes to the Asia Pacific region. We do have some non Asia Pacific economies that we've measured um, that's right at the bottom in, in white, and you can see Brazil, Germany, South Africa, UAE, UK, and the USA. Uh, just as a comparative, we've just put the figures down for you guys to have a look at so you can uh, get an idea of some of the uh, benchmarks throughout the whole entire world. The other report that we like to look at when we talk about resilience is the TRPC's Data Center Security Index. This is a new index that's just come out uh, in 2020, and this has got to do with six factors, infrastructure risk, energy risk, natural risk, business risk, political risk, and legal risk. These are the risks that we think impact data center security. And when it comes to making sure that your infrastructure is resilient and how much of it is strong and in its fundamentals, we think that these six uh, parameters or this, these six risks actually do contribute very much to data center security. Uh, you can see that each individual risk is, is broken down a little bit more into specific uh, areas which we can, we can measure. And for example, infrastructure risk, you've got quality of roads, efficiency of train services, airport connectivity, efficiency of seaport services, secure internet service, for energy risk, electri electrification rate, uh, renewables, etc. So, you know, have a quick look through all of this and let us know if you think that we've got the parameters right or they've got the parameters right. Uh, should we be including other risks as well? And we, we, hope, we hope that it's actually fairly balanced and that it gives a true idea of where data center security uh, risks do emerge from. This next slide therefore shows you and uh, the overall uh, data center security risk index scores for the rest of Asia Pacific. Uh, these are 18 economies that we survey. And you can see what I've circled in red are the lowest, the three lowest scores for each economy. And you'll note that the natural risk and energy risk and infrastructure risk are pretty circ circled pretty high. Business risk and political risk, thank goodness, are not as uh, heavily circled. I suppose that makes it uh, good at that point in time that we took the, the survey that we are not as a region uh, prone to business risk, nor political risk, not at the moment. But indeed, natural risk, energy risk, and infrastructure risks are quite high in the sort of impacting the data centers uh, security. And we're not quite sure whether this is going to impact the, the way forward in the future, but it is certainly an indication that things uh, could be a little bit better. So if you're looking for an opportunity, well, you can see, use our, use these two, or use these three uh, indexes and have a look and see where you'd like to spread your risk out at. I'm going to spend some time right now to talk about some, some of the economies that we're covering and the sort of how does the resilience and data center demand and supply look like in some of these economies? Now, I'm not going to cover all of the economies. I really encourage you to be engaging with me, engaging with the rest of the Marketplace Live book uh, today in the discussion. So if you've got comments or anything, please do send me an email or uh, comment in the comment bar. We'd love to be chatting with you. But in the meantime, let me just cover a couple of uh, economies, including Hong Kong, Singapore, India, and Indonesia. Now, for Hong Kong, how does the resilience and data center uh, in Asia Pacific look for Hong Kong? Well, pre-pandemic, there were really strong supply numbers. And uh, from some reports, there's actually 54% of all demand comes from Hong Kong. And apparently, the there was uh, 4.2 million square footage of supply that was due, that is due to enter the market in these two years. And 82%, it shouldn't be a but, I'm sorry, it should be an and, and 82% of this 4.2 million square foot of uh, supply, of data center supply, has already been subscribed. Will this continue? Not quite sure. Uh, I asked the question, will the pandemic result in the default in some of these subscriptions? And um, we're not quite sure because the impact of COVID-19 on uh, business is looking fairly severe, but we're not quite sure whether it will directly impact some of the defaults on these subscriptions. Second question, and this is where I'd love to hear uh, some of your opinions on as well. 
are these figures for entering the China market or is it just transit via Hong Kong data? Does this really matter when it comes to subscriptions for data centers? How does that how does that factor in? Love to hear your thoughts about it. I just have a question and this is something which I'm personally wondering about myself. And uh, of course, there's the impact of the new security law and the new securities and data access regulations for enforcement uh, circular that's come out and we're still all struggling with. There are a lot of questions that we have for Hong Kong. Uh, how does how is that economy going to be playing out in terms of the future? Uh, not quite sure. We'll have a wait and see. But based on pre-pandemic figures, it's looking fairly strong. Moving on to Singapore, how does that look? It's a really unusual situation in Singapore. I sit in Singapore, so I can tell you for a fact, it's a very unusual situation. Uh, there is a 2019 moratorium on building data centers in Singapore. And as you can tell, it's 2020 now, it's still not been lifted. Uh, this is because of the green energy uh, and, and uh, environmental risk that, that data centers obviously play into. And we're not quite sure whether this is going to last till 2021 or even longer. Uh, apparently, more than 140 megawatts is still going to come online, but we do have to see that the country does have a 2015 Paris Agreement emission uh, targets to be to be hitting. So I think that this all plays into the the moratorium itself. There is also um, an increased carbon footprint from everybody, not just Singapore, by the way, just everybody because of the pandemic use of non-recyclables. Everybody's using more plastic, I think, because everyone's using takeout, etc. And of course. Uh, there in Singapore, I mean, uh, in Singapore, there is an oversupply in electricity from reports. Apparently, there is a 48 percent uh, spare capacity with only 1.4 percent growth in 2017. So we're not quite sure whether that's going to play out in the calculations for the emissions target. So this is a big uh, question mark. Uh, although everybody's sort of saying, well, COVID-19 black swan impact on electricity, still not quite visible at the moment. We'll have to wait till the end of the year and we'll see the statistics come out. The issues continue to be the same in Singapore for uh, data center. We've got land, uh, land limitation issues and, of course, being a tropical country, cooling and PUE issues are uh, really a big question. Besides the moratorium being lifted around the, around the questions of when exactly it's being lifted, I don't know, my crystal ball isn't answering me at the moment, <laughs> but we do have an interesting trend of mixed land use proposals that have been set up, for example, in uh, the Jurong Innovation District Hub, as well as the Tanga Smart or Sustainable Town. I'm getting differing, uh, differing reports on what it's called, the Tanga uh, Smart and Sustainable Town, because that is where the idea of an industrial land use side by side with residential land use is going to come into play. So that might actually impact the way that uh, data centers do service the community and service other uh, surrounding neighborhoods that they're in. So those are interesting uh, developments within Singapore, even though we have that 2019 moratorium. Indonesia, lots of excitement, always been lots of excitement, lots of discussion about the potential for the data center market. It's It's been projected at really exciting growth figures, 11% during the period uh, 2019 to 2025. And uh, the investment numbers are like, okay, we're going to expect more than $1 billion of uh, investment into the economy. And every time I see $1 billion, I always think, you know, Austin, how is it $1 million? But there you have it. The, the projections are always very exciting. Uh, there are there are definitely a, a, a big untapped market of unknowing users who use the cloud and use data centers. For example, in 2015, I think that there was a survey done, millions and millions of Facebook users in uh, Indonesia have no idea that they're actually using the internet. Apparently the survey went to survey them and said, are you using uh, the internet? No, 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 I'm, I'm not an internet user. Are you using Facebook? Yes, I use it every day. So it was one of those weird situations where it could be that there are um, the, the, some of the demand is latent, some of the demand for data centers uh, uh, is not known yet because some of the companies that are, have grown up in using the cloud might actually not be cognizant of the fact that they might want to be building further on the cloud, which is an interesting prospect. So the question is, where where is this demand therefore going to come from? Could they come from these unconscious uh, born in the cloud companies and unconscious cloud consumers uh, who are looking to take their businesses further? Maybe. 
Uh, there is a bit of slowed investment, uh, questionable investment for, not questionable investment, but slowed investment uh, over the last three years because of the impact of the data localization demands from the policies. And I know that that's not quite cleared up yet, GRE2. Uh, we're not quite cl clear yet. So it is a bit of a big question mark with regard to its regulatory position on data centers and how that's going to be uh, impacting the uh, demand and the supply. In, on top of that, it remains a pretty sprawling archipelago. And for those of you who are in infrastructure builds, you know that islands that suddenly disappear during high tide, that is actually a bit of a problem when it comes to building infrastructure. Finally, India, really big country. We have uh, lots of big and sprawling demands that that demand that is being seen from this particular country. Uh, however, the demand is a little bit uneven, and I'm saying that not because I think that demand is uneven, but because we're actually seeing uh, reports from a national level and then on a state by state level, but not every state is reporting on its figures. There is, for example, an eight percent growth apparently in the data center supply in the market, but where exactly is it being grown in? How and who's taking up these? Uh, this data center capacity, we're not quite sure. My guess is Chennai, Mumbai, and of course Bangalore. I'm sorry, I should have put Bangalore in as well. Uh, but you know, question is, I need, we need, we need stronger figures. We need, we need more granular figures uh, on a state by state basis, perhaps in order to make a better uh, judgment on where exactly this resilience and uh, the data center demand and supply in India is is playing out in. But overall, it looks like a pretty positive, uh, positive development and demand and supply in, uh, sorry, for demand at least in 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 India. Uh, there is, similar to Indonesia, there is data localization policy, which now is, uh, we're seeing a real impact in slowing down uh, investment uh, and, and causing some investment uncertainty in India, which is making some people a bit nervous about it. So we're not quite sure how that's going to play out. I think that a lot of the policymakers are still working through the process of this. Good news is that the government themselves are very much pro-cloud. There's, there's the Meg Raj cloud, which is the king of the clouds, or the, or the Gov cloud policy. I do know also that there is a big plan for 100 smart cities to be developed in India. And all of these policies are driving emerging technology adoption, which is super duper fantastic. What we're seeing in terms of trends, and that brings me to the questions, you know, for for now, we're seeing COVID-19 lockdowns and we're seeing amazing, amazing uh, data demand, data use demand from consumers. I mean, this is on the petabyte level demand, okay? So will this fade away soon? We do see a lot of the uh, the reverse migrations happen, the reverse uh, urbanization happening, everybody's migrating back to uh, suburban areas into back into their hometowns with work from home. And this might actually be permanent because if, if that's, and if that's the case, um, how is, how would that uh, affect the, that state by state data that we need to get in the first instance? How is that going to uh, impact how the demand is like, the demand patterns are like within the Indian subcontinent? Really, really big current, uh, really, really big problem. They have a huge young population. Also, there is a mobile first population, and this, this is, uh, th this is the, the group of people, the demographic who are brought up on this unicorn fairy tale, you know, come up with a startup and get, you know, series A, B, C, D, E, F, G funding. And they're very familiar with these Silicon Valley tech stories, which are, um, uh, based on companies which are built on the cloud. But how will this translate to demand? Uh, we're not quite sure yet, but given the fact that it's a very young economy, uh, not a young economy, but a very young demographic that is leading this trend right now, it really looks like uh, India has a really positive growth uh, trajectory ahead of it. Am I right? Am I wrong? I'm not really sure. Are, is your economy resilient or not? I cannot tell you for a fact. I can just, I can just tell you what uh, our observations are, which is what I've shared with you today. I hope that you have learned something today. If not, if you if you have a dispute with me, you say, no, man, you're totally wrong about this. Um, I encourage you, you see my name and my email and my Twitter hashtag, uh, my Twitter uh, um, uh, handle there for you to be com communicating and arguing with me. Tell me if I'm right, tell me if I'm wrong, tell me what you think. I'd love to hear from you. Thank you very much for joining me today at Marketplace Live. I look forward to hearing from you and uh, hear from you soon. Bye.